<laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, why don't we get started? Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm David Pennock. I am, am director of Dimax. Uh, this is our lounge. This is our floor. Welcome here. Uh, it's great to have all of you here. Um, Dimax is a math and computing research center. It's based here at Rutgers and has several academic and corporate partners um, up and down the East Coast. Uh, the mission of Dimax is to conduct research, to catalyze research, and to develop educational programs in the mathematical sciences. Uh, this workshop is part of our mission to catalyze research. So the idea is bring people together from different disciplines uh, in order to spark research on a topic that we think is, is ripe for innovation. Um, so this workshop is part of a multi-year special focus on the topic of mechanism design and decision making. Uh, we've had several workshops already on this topic. We will have more workshops on this topic, uh, including one coming up, uh, kind of immediate follow-up on this workshop or related workshop in December in Paris. And um, Alexis and Fred can give more details about that workshop and welcome many of you to check that out and consider coming to that workshop. Um, yeah, so this workshop, in part, it came together at another workshop in October on um, machine learning and game theory. And Sanmai and I were part of a breakout group that discussed having a workshop on this topic. And Fred and Alexis were already thinking about a topic like this. And then we all kind of came together. And I'm, I'm really thrilled with how it came together with uh, the speakers we have and the participants we have. I, I just, uh, it's fantastic, the lineup, and so thank you all. Um, I'd also, so I'd like to thank my co-organizers, Fred, Alexis, and San Mai. Uh, I'd like to thank Nicole and Walt and others on Dimax staff who did a ton of work behind the scenes to make this happen. Nicole did, you know, kind of all, almost all of the details of how this thing came together from travel to set up to everything. So give, definitely, uh, if you see Nicole, say hello and thank you. Um, Yeah, I think I've covered everything I wanted to say in the opening remarks, so I'm absolutely thrilled to get started. And I'll, on that note, well, I'll just remind speakers, we've built in into your time period. We'd like to have some time for questions, so try to leave at least five minutes for questions uh, within your time period uh, to speakers. And so now I'll just turn it over to Fred, who will introduce our first keynote speaker. Thank you, Dave. And welcome everybody. So uh, this is a, a topic that uh, here at Dimax we've been particularly interested in over many years. Because we started uh, as one of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institutes uh, way back about 2013 when we did uh, a, uh, a year on mathematics for planet Earth. And we continued that here at DIMAX with a five-year program. And we've been looking ever since to figure out how we're going to jumpstart the continuation of that. So uh, this seems like a great opportunity. And I, uh, what I'd like to stress here is that we have uh, a great group. And uh, we're not just here to hear speakers. We're really here to try to uh, engage. And the hope is we can identify ways to continue the uh, the discussion that we start here. So we'll try to leave as much time for discussion, especially over lunch. We've got lunch groups. Uh, we'll ask you to actually do some work over lunch. So we'll divide this room up into tables, and we'll uh, uh, let you go to the table that you choose. Uh, they'll have different themes. We'll ask you to actually make a report out at some point. Uh, so. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we've had a number of changes in the program in the last couple of days. Uh, so great thanks to um, Tony Broccoli, who's going to fill in on climate change tomorrow at the last minute, and Laurent Jha, who is going to fill in uh, as well tomorrow. Uh, we also had a last minute cancellation uh, last night, uh, uh, Manish Raghavan, who was on the program for this morning. So no fillers there. 
uh, unless somebody wants to give an impromptu talk. <laughs> so what I'm suggesting is that we actually push um, to his talk up a little bit earlier, and we have a little bit more time for lunch. Um, we'll work that out as we go. So uh, let's get right to the highlight of the morning. Uh, Malin Tambe is somebody I've known for uh, quite a while. Uh, we collaborated in various endeavors uh, in local security, among others. Uh, I'm just delighted that he could join us today. Uh, and if you read some of his awards and honors, and I'm going to because uh, I want to, uh, uh, it's just amazing. So uh, Melinda is uh, the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Center for Research and Computation and Society at Harvard. He's also Principal Scientist and Director of AI for Social Good at Google Research. He's received numerous prizes, including the AAAI Feigenbaum Prize, the John McCarthy Award, the ACM Autonomous Agents Research Award, the AIIII Robert S. Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award. He's a fellow of AIIII and ACM. He's received the Informs Wagner Prize for Excellence in Operations Research Practice and the Wrist Prize from the Military Operations Research Society. And uh, he's received the Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award for his work on AI and public safety. He's received commendations from numerous practitioners, including the Coast Guard and the Federal Air Marshal Service and the Airport Police of uh, Los Angeles. And I'm so glad he's working on AI for social good. And he's the perfect guy to set us up for this meeting. Lord, thank you for coming. Thank you. Fred, uh, that was super kind. Thank you. Uh, thank you for organizing this workshop. And really, so awesome to be here. Thank you, Sanmai and David and Lirong and uh, all the people who contributed to this workshop. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, AI for social impact. So for the past 15 years, uh, my team and I have been focused on advancing AI and multi-agent systems for social impact, focusing on topics of public health, conservation and public safety and security. The key challenge is how to optimize our limited intervention resources. So in order to show you that achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand, as well as give you some overview of our previous work, with respect to public health, we have large populations to serve, limited number of public health resources. So a concrete example is work we have done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information and reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. But this work requires innovation in the area of uh, social network algorithms because the social networks are not given to us ahead of time. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect limited number of ranger resources. A concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia and Belize. We're harnessing past poaching data. We are able to predict when poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been able to remove tens of thousands of these snares. This work requires innovation in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. And previously, in the area of public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stack and Work Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by agency, security agencies such as the Federal Air Marshals and the Coast Guard and others. So these are all long-term commitments in my group. Um, for example, 12 years of public safety and security that the work then migrated into conservation and public health. And they may seem like diverse areas of application, but they are tied together by common underlying models in multi-agent systems. Today's talk, I will focus on some of our newest work in AI for maternal and child care that's tied to the UN SDGs. I'll start with a mobile health program, it's called Emitra, which has about 150,000 beneficiaries, mothers, enrolled at a time in the program. I'll then briefly advertise our recent start of a program, work with 
Kilkari, which is the world's largest mobile health program for microbial and child care. <coughs> and then, if time remains, I'll come back to the work we've done in the past for AI for HIV prevention. Um, highlight papers for the past two years in AAA, AI, etc. I'll focus mostly on real world results. If you're interested, there are more simulations and so forth. I'll highlight the role of the lead PhD student by putting up their picture in the top right hand corner. And one particular individual I wanted to highlight is a key collaborator at uh, Google Research India, Aparna Taneja, who's a co author of many of these papers. So let me start with uh, AI for maternal and child care. So um, the motivation here is the maternal mortality crisis that we face. The UN Sustainable Development Target says that the maternal mortality ratio, mothers dying during childbirth and soon after, should be below 70 per 100,000 live births. So if you look at where we are, in Western Europe, the numbers are small, four or so. In the United States, the numbers are 30 and crazy. And in the rest of the world, of course, the numbers are actually much, much worse, uh, more than double the UN target. So this may seem like a problem that's for other countries, but it's very much here in the United States. As our um, Dean for School of Public Health points out, for black women in Mississippi, the mortality ratio is 65.1 deaths per 100,000 life births, 20 times worse than women in Greece, Poland, or Slovenia. Something she says every citizen in the United States ought to know. So I will focus today, though, on this challenge in India where the maternal mortality ratio is declining, but still way above the UN Sustainable Development Goal. We have been very fortunate to be working with a non-profit called Arman that's uh, active in 19 states in India, works with 26 million mothers in India, and it's a very large-scale NGO, has many, many programs that they run. We have been inspired by the founder of Arman, Dr. Aparna Hegde, says uh, you know, pregnancy is not a disease, childhood is not an ailment, and dying due to a natural life event is not acceptable. Uh, she's a very inspiring figure, uh, many, many awards to her name, but uh, for example, Fortune magazine points uh, to her as world's 50 greatest leaders in 2021. I met with her in uh, Starbucks in Mumbai uh, four years ago, and decided that this was a good, uh, we decided that we could collaborate and after a lot of discussions on what, top, what within our scope of programs uh, for NGO we could work on, we focused on this program, mobile health program called MFR. This is a weekly two-minute automated voice message that goes out to mothers exploiting the fact that cell phones are very, very widely available. So it's a message of the kind, you are three months into your pregnancy, you should use this health supplement. Or, your baby is three weeks old, get the baby vaccinated. This is a message, two minute, <coughs> delivered in the local language. The idea is that mothers enroll and they get these messages. Two million mothers have so far benefited from this program. So 141 voice messages from the time the mother registered all the way to the baby being one year old. And it has shown in randomized control trials run by Arman, significant benefits, 30% increase in infants with triple birth weight at the end of the year, 29% uh, increase in women who had more than four ANC visits, and so forth. So where do we come in? Unfortunately, mothers enroll, and 30 to 40% of the mothers then drop out. They become low listeners. To understand why, we went with Arman to the sites where they enrolled these mothers to the homes of the families that are enrolled. I have grown up in Mumbai and I know many of these places, but going inside the homes of these families who earn way little, uh, they're all families uh, that are way below the international poverty line in terms of their earning power. It is not difficult to understand why due to economic pressures people may choose to drop out. So what can we do? So Arman has this call center from where they give out service calls to mothers to try to encourage them to stay in the program. But the call center can only call a small number of mothers. The question is how can we optimize who they call in order to retain mothers in the program. So consider the fact that there may be 100,000 beneficiaries. Um, 
of enrolled in the program. Each of them gets a health message every week. This is an automated voice message. But there is a service call center that can call only a thousand of these mothers via a live human call, not automated, to talk to this mother. And the question is, which thousand should we choose every week so as to maximize the total number of health messages that are listening? So consider this example where you have one health worker. She has five mothers in this example uh, in her care, four shown in red, have not listened to a health message, one shown in green has. And now she goes ahead and she has to choose only two of these five. So supposing she chooses the first two who are shown in red, this turned out to be a good choice. Those two turn, turn to green, they start listening. Another one autom uh, automatically or automatically turns to green. So this is a good thing. Now she has to decide again next week, who do I call? Which two mothers do I call? She chooses the two in red, but this turns out to be a bad choice. Not only the two reds remain reds, but other two greens also turn to red. The point here is that there's a challenge in choosing these thousand beneficiaries per week. A call, service call may not change a beneficiary state, but beneficiaries may be changing their state on their own from listening to not listening. So how do you pick 1,000 out of 100,000? we turn to restless bandits, choosing K out of N arms per week. For those who may not be familiar with restless bandits, each arm, in this case a mother, is modeled as a Markov decision problem. So a mother might be in a bad state, she has not listened to a voice call or a good state, she has listened to this automated message. We can intervene on this mother by giving her a service call to encourage her or not. And then we have these transition matrices that govern her behavior that we can model so if we give a service call, probability of transitioning from bad state, where she's not listened to this automated message to a good state, is 0.8. But if we don't, it's 0.2. So now, in reality, of course, we have 100,000 such arms, and we have to pick 1,000 of these. This is a very difficult problem. Um, so to solve this, one approach that's been used in the literature is to compute a Whittle index, a ranking of these arms where a Whittle index computes the benefit of intervention on that arm. More formally, it's the infimum subsidy you give to the passive action such that the Q value of the passive and active actions become equal, but I'm not going to get into that. Let's just assume that we can rank these mothers. There is no known general purpose algorithm to compute Whittle indices. Fortunately, for these kinds of cases, we had created one in almost 2016 <coughs> that we are going to use, and we used so that we can then rank all the mothers and choose the top 1,000 to call. In order to prove asymptotic activity, there's a condition called indexability that we also prove, proven here. Um, I'm not going to get into that. There's a paper by Weber and Weiss that everybody cites in this literature from 1992. Say this, you know, computing indexability, you get to asymptotic activity. I'll come back to this point a little bit later on. So now, we've got almost everything except that we actually don't know the behaviors of these mothers, the transition probabilities are not known. So fortunately, we have past data. For mothers, we have features like income, education, uh, number of children, etc., and engagement sequences. They were in a bad state, got a call, service call, went to a bad state. Bad state, service call, good state, etc. So from this past data, which we have from collecting the Hermann's data, we can now do prediction, learning, that maps the mother's features, uh, age, income, etc., to transition probabilities. So given a new mother who comes in, given her age, income, and so on, we can say these are her behaviors, these are her transition probabilities. And then we optimize by choosing, uh, computing little indexes and choosing the top 1,000, and now it's time to evaluate. So. This, as far as we know, first large scale application of restless bandage for public health. We uh, did a study with 23,000 beneficiaries, divided them into three groups of 7,667 each. The first group was a restless bandage group, the other group was a round robin, and third was current standard of care. We pulled 225 arms per week. That is, we gave 225 calls in the restless bandage group. It was those with the highest riddle indices in that week. For the round robin group, it's the first 225, then the next 225, then the next 225. Current standard of care, no calls are going out. And the question is, how many more health messages, the automated health messages, 
are listened to in each of these groups compared to the current standard of care. And here's what we find. Along the x-axis are different weeks. Along the y-axis is cumulatively how many more messages are listened to compared to current standard of care. We can see that round robin hardly achieves any improvement, but the RMAP group, 600 more messages are listened to compared to the current standard of care. So what do we take away from this? It's important to optimize service calls. If you just call people round robin, we've also tried random. There is no improvement over the current standard of care. RMAP, the trustless bandit, cuts by 32%, the drop-off rate over the current standard of care. And these results, RMAP versus current standard of care, uh, is statistically significant, but round robin versus current standard of care is not. What we actually obtain here are conservative estimates, not exact key values, and a recent ICML paper that talks about how shuff we can do shuffling of participants to get tighter estimates. This is actually a very interesting problem my statistician colleagues tell me. So having done this study, the next question was to deploy this system. So we deployed this. The system is called Saheli. It's an acronym. It also means a friend in Hindi. Uh, this is just to tell you we've spent enormous amounts of time coming up with a good acronym for this project. <laughs> So this is deployed. Um, it's been serve, uh, serving beneficiaries since April 2015. 150,000 mothers have been served uh, in the system, meaning we, uh, we are assisting her mom with. Drop-offs prevented from the sample, we can estimate about 30%. And for bottom 25% dialogue mothers who are listeners, bottom 25 of listeners, the total amount of listening has more than doubled to these health messages. So this is clearly seen as a benefit by Dr. Hegde in this video, you, uh, YouTube video if you wanted to see. We are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI, so we are very grateful for what she said. There's also a, some interviews with the beneficiaries. I'm going to play one for you, hopefully to play, uh, from the same video. <laughs> understand why these service calls helped. So we did a survey of 500 service call receivers. Did service call help? 60% said yes, 40% said no. Why did they help? Of the 60%, more than 70% said that they got more information about the program, more motivation to keep this. Who did the service calls reach? Remember, these are all people who are under the international poverty line. But even within that, we can divide them up by their income, zero to 5,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees. This is monthly income, so that's like less than $100 a month, uh, and so on. And the yellow is the whole population distributed along uh, in this way, in these different income categories. The blue is the, where the service calls went. And what we can see is that the blue are more skewed towards people with lower income, even within this low income. Similarly with education, the blue tend to be that the service calls are going to be to people with lower education than the, uh, in terms of comparison with the whole population. Um, we can also think about why did we need a vital index, could we do something simpler? So we have looked at uh, different strategies like, okay, let's just, given all the data we have collected in the past, we built a simulator, try a greedy approach with a restless bandit rather than a Whittle index approach, and we can see that the Whittle index in simulation still performs better. So there's some benefit to actually using this Whittle index approach. So let me now go to the next phase of our deployment. So far, we've talked about this data for deployment pipeline, where in the on the first stage we predict. So we try to be as accurate as possible in predicting behaviors of mothers, and then we optimize, choose the top k mothers using this written index. So first, improve, maximize learning accuracy, then maximize decision quality. 
However, maximizing learning accuracy does not lead to maximization of decision quality. The two are not aligned. In fact, we can see this in this data set in our model. Data set one shown in orange has a higher learning accuracy. Blue has lower learning accuracy. We can predict behaviors more accurately in the orange data set. So you would imagine that when we give service calls based on the orange data set, we would lead to more mothers listening to these health messages. We are more accurately predicting their behaviors. In fact, the opposite is true. The blue leads to higher health messages being listened to. So the point here is that we have to be careful about aligning learning accuracy and decision quality. And to illustrate this, consider this very simple illustrative example. There's a feature on the AX axis of predicting transition probabilities. The blue are all low risk mothers who are larger in number, red are all high risk mothers, higher in number. If we now say maximize learning accuracy and learn a green regression line, it is able to more accurately predict all the blue dots, maximizing learning accuracy, but it has low decision quality because it missed all the high risk mothers. Decision focused learning is the idea that we modify the loss function of learning so that it directly maximizes the student quality. Now it learns this newer green regressor line which has a low learning accuracy because it clearly is not going to predict very well the blue dots which are in majority. But it predicts the ones that we really want which are the high risk mothers and so it leads to higher decision quality. So this is an approach where instead of taking gradients to improve the MDP transition probability accuracy, they're taking gradients from the actual final decision quality. And this requires differentiation through the Brittle Index, and so one of the key results here from Kai Wang, who's the PhD student who did this work, was to show that the Brittle Index itself is differential. So having done it, we ran another RCT now with 9,000 mothers divided into three arms, decision-focused learning, two-stage model, first learn and then optimal, and then current standard of and what we see here is uh, with the two-stage model, we have a higher learning accuracy, just as we saw earlier. Blue has a lower learning accuracy. This is the newer decision-focused learning that aligns machine learning with actual final decision quality. But then if you look at deployment performance, we did service calls to these mothers. How many more health messages are listened to? We see that blue, which is decision-focused learning, leads to higher performance, more mothers, more messages being listened to by these mothers compared to this two-stage model. So now we've deployed this decision-focused learning. This is what works at our mind today, day to day. And main point to take away from all of this, it's important to align, if you have a predict and optimize system, then important to align prediction and optimization rather than simply going for maximizing predictive accuracy. So, I wanted to highlight now the directions in which we are going for computer scientists, for AI researchers, uh, and also essentially to talk to you about some of the new things you're pursuing. So I talked so far about a restless bandit approach, which uses a Markov model, uses Whittle indices. It does offline learning, and it's focused on maternal and child care. So we are now relaxing all of these conditions, trying to go for a non brittle approach, meaning Instead of assuming that we exactly know the transition probabilities, can we imagine that there's uncertainty in these transition probabilities? Imagine that we have actually a non-Markov processes to model. And finally, this idea that indexability is not enough. We've also explored online learning, and then finally, other health challenges beyond maternal and child. So I'm going to quickly run through some of these ideas. Um, each of these is like a triple AI paper from 23 or so and so on. So consider, for example, instead of predicting exactly the transition probability of each mother, we say that you know it's between 0.4 and 0.7 rather than exactly 0.55. So we have this interval uncertainty, and now we want to know how do you compute the middle indices. So we do this by minimizing maximum regret. So our algorithm is trying to choose Whittle index ranking to maximize performance, but nature is trying to choose transition probabilities to actually cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. It's a zero-sum game against nature, where we are trying to maximize, nature is trying to minimize. So it's minimizing its maximum regret. So if you think about this in terms of this game, the restless bandit approach is using these kinds of policies. It's ranking all the Whittle indices along the rows. 
columns is nature trying to choose parameter settings from a continuous interval. This is a massive scale game. If you imagine choosing a thousand arms, uh, ranking thousand out of hundred thousand, that's a massive number of policies for nature for the restless bandit planner. And nature is choosing policies from continuous interval. It's a massive number of strategies for nature. So solving this game is difficult. Representing it in memory is difficult. To solve this, we use a double oracle approach. We initialize these games with a small number of strategies on both players. And then a planner's oracle provides the planner's best response, uh, which uh, adds one more policy. And then nature's oracle adds nature's best response. The game grows in this fashion. We iterate on the convergence. And usually, these iterations happen fast. So if convergence happens fast without expanding the whole game. And we apply this in simulation to Arman data to show that indeed our robust approach would lower the regret compared to what is being done currently. So that's one idea. Another idea is to relax this Markov assumption. So rather than assuming that we have a first order Markov process mm -hmm. along the x-axis here showing higher and higher order Markov processes, and how well do we predict behavior in the Arman data set? We can see that our prediction power increases. So given that, we can use a time series restless bandit, so essentially using LSTMs, time series models, to predict future states. And so with this, we have now a new index, which we call time series arm ranking index, um, and shown that in simulation, if we picked mothers using this DARI index rather than the middle index, we would lead to better performance. A final paper uh, that I wanted to highlight is this indexability is not enough for Wittu. So this is going back to the Weber and Weiss paper from 1990, which gets cited often to show that it's, uh, you know, you do indexability, now you are approximately up, you are approaching approximate optimality. Here we have other conditions that need to be satisfied too, if you do the fine print in the paper, homogeneity, irreducibility, global attractor property, infinite horizon average rewards. You have to satisfy all of these in order to get what you want. But it turns out that uh, this is often not the case. And so we also provide an alternative approach on, uh, based on mean field planning and show that in simulation, this mean field planning would lead to better results for our model. So these are three different threads that we're pursuing in order to continue to improve these results for our model. Um, in terms of online learning, I talked about a two action case, we can imagine more than two actions, more than diff different ways of intervening on the mother. And in particular, this approach called UC Whittle, upper confidence bound Whittle, where we select the top K arms. And then, based on this top K selection, we maintain confidence bounds on the transition probability. So, this is usual upper confidence bound stochastic bandwidth approach type style of algorithm, except higher transition probability doesn't mean higher Whittle index. So, from this upper uh, confidence, you have to compute the upper confidence bounds on the brittle indices and then select top key arms. And again, we can show that this leads to lower regret. And finally, other health challenges. We think about something like tuberculosis. It's a similar challenge of, um, of course, it's a, you know, it's a disease that kills massive numbers of people worldwide. It's a TB treatment that requires people to take their medicine for six months. I get tired if I'm asked to take some kind of a course for six days. Six <laughs> months, people uh, drop off their side effects. And so how do you ensure that people continue to take their medicine? Because otherwise, you have uh, drug-resistant bacteria, and people themselves don't work, get well. So again, we have a health center from where these uh, health workers are giving service calls to TB patients to say, hey, take your medicine. And again, they have hundreds of patients in their care. They may be able to call a small number every day. So in this case, she may pick the first three. Two of them say, I took my medicine last night. The last one says, I did not. And now she has to decide tomorrow again, who do I call? Not knowing who has taken their medicine and who has not. And so it goes on. It's similar to the maternal and child care problem, except we don't know the beneficiary state ahead of time. We only get the state revealed when we actually call this patient. So this is a challenge of an R map, a restless bandit with partial observability. And so we have a new RIPS paper that shows how do you solve these R maps with partial observability. And the idea is this collapsing bandit. So if you call somebody, uncertainty collapses because they reveal their state. And that's, that's how you can solve these problems. Similarly, problems of diabetes. Um, there's you know, a lot of people who suffer. And 
there is now a lot of digital apps where patients self-manage by logging exercise, meals, medications, blood sugar, and so on. And again, the restless bandit approaches, if there are health coaches that we want to have them talk to a few people to improve their uh, meals or exercise or blood sugar monitoring, etc., we can decide who they should contact. Again, some simulation results showing that RMAP in simulation, this is with uh, uh, publicly available data, could potentially lead to improved performance over current apps. So that's, I'm now going to switch over and talk to you about uh, advertising for the next program that uh, we are getting involved in. They're very excited by this. This is this Kilkari program, which is the largest mobile health program in the world. So this is a program that's run by India's Ministry of Health and Welfare. Um, so this advertisement here talks about 5.28 crore audio messages. That's 52 million audio messages going out. There are 30 million mothers who have benefited from this program in total. 3 million active subscribers at a time. And Arman is tasked with scaling it up further up all across India. But there are lots of challenges here. First, obviously, if you think about restless bandits and so forth, now it's one with 3 million mothers. There are no demographic features made available to us because of privacy concerns. So now, we, all the things we did earlier to learn transition probabilities all go away. There is no call center big enough to give service calls on this massive scale. Um, so there's local health workers per village who we have to task to go intervene on these mothers, and that leads to other challenges. And there's significant regional variations across India. So question is, uh, so just to show you, we have started working uh, with this data set there's no demographic features available, but can we use past listenership in these calls to make predictions about future listenership? So, past 12 weeks of how they listen to these calls, then eight weeks later, will they fall into a low listenership pattern? For six weeks, will they listen to less than 25% of messages in the sequence? And we can show that over 250,000 beneficiaries, we can get reasonable accuracy and precision, but of course, if we could get access to the actual demographic data, we would improve the situation, but we won't. So we have to continue to work with this data set that we have. But this is only one of the challenges that we face here of trying to improve these kinds of predictions, but then doing the interventions and so on. So very excited by, these, uh, by this program. Uh, to understand more, uh, we've done field visits uh, in villages in India, and our goal now is to reach 1 million beneficiaries in 2023. So that's where we want to get. I should point out that we've also worked with other non-profits. One in particular is Health Mom in Nigeria. This is a paper in Sky 22 about AI-driven vaccine interventions. This is a paper, we did simulation results. We are very grateful that Health Mom has taken these results and now deployed them. We were not involved in the deployment, but we're happy to see these ideas being taken forward. So uh, I have one more section. I can stop here or continue. You're good. So let me take the last five minutes to talk to you about our previous work on AI for HIV prevention. This was work done while I was in Los Angeles, um, driven by the fact that there was a homeless uh, camp right across my office at USC. And so the goal here is to reduce HIV in this population. The rates of HIV in the homeless youth population, there's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles, 10 times the rate of the normal house population. Try to reduce these HIV rates. There's public health campaigns that get run by the drop-in centers, home shelters. They're called key peer leaders because you can't talk to all 6,000 youth. Educate them about HIV prevention. Expect them to talk to their friends and their friends to talk to their friends. Information to spread in the network. This is real face-to-face -face interaction, not happening on Facebook. And the question is, can we optimize who are the peer leaders? Can we select better who the peer leaders are? So. Here's a social network here. Each number is a youth. Each red line is an edge uh, that represents friendship between you. And we have to select, say, three peer leaders to maximize expected number of influence nodes, people who have got information about each other. Information here is supposed to propagate through this independent cascade model. So if youth C is educated about HIV, their friend B will get to know 
information with the probability of 0.4, and if D got informed, then D will inform E with the probability of 0.4. So this is the common model that's used, and there's a lot of literature on how to select these key peer leaders. Now, when we try to apply it in our context, there are several challenges. First, I said 0.4 is the probability, but we don't know that ahead of time. Also, these youth are in difficult circumstances. If we say, come to the center for this session, one of them may get arrested on the way, uh, may not show up. Another one may choose to have decided, because of circumstances, to run away from Los Angeles and send their friend instead. So the youth who show up aren't necessarily the youth you wanted. And so you need a multi-step dynamic policy to recruit more youth along the way. And the social network itself is unknown. So we can do a limited query of sa to sample a small fraction of the network, but that's all we can do in order to scale up the program. So we have solved all of these challenges uh, with a system called Change that does network sampling, robust multi-step policy, and then peer leader selection. So it decides which peer leaders to select, educate the rest of the network about HIV prevention. We ran this trial in Los Angeles. This was done with uh, my friend, Professor Eric Price, in the School of Social Work at USC with 750 youth. They were divided into three arms of 250 change, which is our algorithm to choose peer leaders. Degree centrality, choose peer leaders who are the most popular youth in the network. This is the common technique that's used by these shelters. And the control group where absolutely no uh, actual influence maximization is going on. And now we want to know, was there an actual reduction in HIV risk behaviors at the end of one month and at the end of the month? This was work done in collaboration with three homeless shelters in LA, my friend's place, Los Angeles, LGBT center, and safe place for youth. As far as we know, first large scale application of these influence maximization algorithms for public health. And we look at, at the end of one month, if we chose peer leaders using our algorithm, did that lead to increase in the reduction in HIV risk behavior? And looking at reduction in condom less anal sex, we can see that we changed, there is more than 30% reduction. But with degree centrality and control, there is no difference at the end of one month. At the end of three months, degree centrality approach begins to catch up, but change is still superior. We also looked at other metrics, cardinalist vaginal sex, and again, change is superior. There are statistical significance results in our AAAI Journal of AIDS papers. And this is what our collaborator had to say about this. It's a way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. So there's a lot of interesting topics to continue to investigate in the future. One is that influence spread doesn't spread uh, equitably across these different racial groups. So how can we try to improve fairness across groups? And there are many approaches that we've tried. Um, instead of our hand-driven algorithms, could we use RL? So that's another area of work that has been ongoing. So I'll end here with uh, just giving you key lessons we've learned from some of this work in AI for social impact that we've been engaged in since 2006, 2007. First, uh, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. So doing social impact work doesn't mean that we sacrifice on innovating in AI. Partnerships with the nonprofits, government, and local communities is crucial in AI for social impact. We don't want to engage in helicopter science, whereby we go to a community, take their data, publish our papers, and run away, but stay engaged with them, delivering impact to them, uh, and stay with them in the long term. We have to look at the entire data to deployment pipeline, not just algorithmic improvements. It's important to step out of the lab and into the field. When I talk to my conservation biology friends, it's like, yes, uh, that is what they do, but as computer scientists, we often don't. Embracing interdisciplinary research um, with social workers, with conservation scientists, and others. And lack of data is the norm in many of these domains. And rather than complaining there is no data, it should be embraced as part of the project strategy. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. To you. Questions? So there was some on your first uh, call delivery one. Um, you talked about the bottom 25%. Um, 
that was the population that I was worried about, the population that was like non-budgeable, right? Like they were not listening and then after the calls they were predicted as not listening still and so they were the one that was probably skipped. And so I'm wondering for those population, um, I mean part of the bottom 25% of the people that are movable and the other part is they are not. And you also showed that 40% of people say that the calls doesn't help them continue. So can you talk a little bit more about this population? No, that's a, that's a good question. There are people who, this algorithm is really trying to say how to optimize this resource, which is the call resource. So there are people who can't be helped by this resource. And then for them, the intervention strategy would be different. Maybe we have to send actual human health workers to their homes or do something different with them. And what, so for that, that's generally the idea that rather than having them be called or harassed repeatedly by giving them calls, we would then say, okay, you know, these are people that are left out of the system. And maybe, Arman, you have health workers, you can go, you know, you have actual people who can go to their homes, not on their doors. That's what we need to do. So the, the numbers I showed you about the 25% non-listeners non who up on their listenership, there are indeed, uh, the RMAP, the Restless Bandit, is making some calculation that there are people who are not movable, exactly like you said, um, and that's what you know. That's what it is trying to do. That's what we are tasked with: how to optimize this resource. Um, there is a you know some amount of discussion that is ongoing right now in terms of continued health study of who's actually benefiting in terms of improvement in health, and then use using that information to perhaps target who the sort of get service calls even better. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's something we want to Thank you for that question. Anyone else? So, thanks, Belinda. It's always super cool to hear about everything you're doing. Um, one thing that I was uh, thinking about as we were talking, right, is that in many of these instances, there's a really clever use of observable or measurable proxies for the eventual outcomes that you care about, right? So when you were talking about HIV AIDS, then you have these proxies like figuring out, okay, how, how often are you having like condomless sex or something like that? Or yeah. in, in other cases, the maternal health, it's like, you know, are you listening to these things, which is eventually, hopefully, hopefully a proxy for, you know, what are the outcomes in right. this kind of situation? Right. Um, I'm just wondering if you, because many of the things that we think about are actually like very, very low probability events, right? It's just that in the in the big picture they add up to a significant number. So I'm wondering if you've thought systematically about this question of like how do we find these proxies that are measurable that we can do something about, or is there anything that we can do with if the only things that we observe are the very low probability events at the end of the day? So I mean the low probability events and so forth is in perhaps an even more complicated question. Even if it's like just, you know, in this case, um, establishing ultimately the health outcomes that we want to observe. So indeed, uh, the, the challenge is that the health outcome results are very, very long-term results. You know, at the end of the year, as the health of the baby improves or something like that. So we have to sort of cascade these different uh, behavior, you know, observations of things that are immediately measurable. Then we can do a long sort of intermediate term study to say, can we observe something that is a little bit longer? And then maybe based on that, do a further study. So that's been our strategy. Um, there's a lot of thoughts I have, but I'm, I'm just, so for example, currently this ongoing study that's going on asks uh, mothers a number of questions, you know, do you feel you have consciously avoided risky work during your pregnancy? Do you think you should rest more during your pregnancy and so forth? So these are trying to get at some of these behavior changes. And we can show that for the uh, approach that used decision-focused learning versus current standard of care. This is very preliminary, it's not published. I uh, just wanted to show you the kind of things that are going on. You can see that there is some movement of mothers going towards having less, uh, you know, avoiding risky behaviors and so on and so forth. So that's the next stage. Uh, establishing even more exactly the longer term effect, that would be an even longer term study and um, you know, requires further patience and so on. 
but it's a it's a very very I mean I've thought a lot about for example in wildlife conservation we measure how many traps are found and removed but you know how many more elephants were saved I mean that's a much more complicated uh, problem and uh, that requires a much longer term uh, study and so I think uh, at least for us in AI for social it's important to have some kind of intermediate goals practically speaking just to get some guidance on whether we are going the right way then from there the next stage uh, and then even as we learn more maybe that allows us to refine uh, you know what our goals ought to be and move on in this fashion that's been our strategy but this is definitely a great topic of discussion of you know what what how to choose these right proxies and at least with the arman um, i noticed that they themselves are not you know it's not like they understand everything uh, so you just talk to them and it's like uh, you know they're not also sure what what's the right proxy is this is this uh, but this seems to be a pretty good one of you know as a listenership gone up as a listenership gone up among the ones who are poor as listeners and so forth and then we we'll have other questions okay, i have a couple please, please. so to what extent are these studies uh, and the methodology that you've developed and, you know, transitionable to other countries? So what you did in Mumbai, will it help you in parts of Mumbai, for instance? Or what would you have to change? So to what extent are social and cultural factors going to influence what you do? So, um, the, so there's two parts of the work. Uh, for example, on the on the domain side, the messaging and so forth to the mothers that goes out. The Kilgari program for it originally came from Ghana. And the person who designed it said that the messages had to be changed quite a bit to adapt them to conditions in India. So on the domain side, I would imagine that there are social cultural change uh, uh, factors that would really need to be taken into account. On the AI side, therefore, there would be some implications to the algorithms. But the underlying uh, ideas of efficient, restless bandits or decision-focused learning and so forth, we would imagine that those techniques would apply to other healthcare channels. And in fact, this idea of adherence bandits, so that these are restless bandits that are geared towards adherence programs in health because they exploit some key properties in the restless bandits. These are not arbitrary restless bandits. These are bandits where assumption is that intervention is always superior to no intervention. So there's some restrictions on the kinds of algorithms. And so that gives you automatically properties like indexability and so forth in the two state case. So there's some properties that would be uh, translatable uh, more easily. But <laughs> I mean, there are definitely social and cultural differences that are going to cause a big impact on how the program gets structured and so on. So we are in touch with some colleague um, in Africa, in Google Africa, who's thinking about similar work. Uh, but it would be very interesting to see what translation of the work is. So thank you. That's a great question. Well, there's or Otherwise, I'm going to dominate with another question. <laughs> uh, you looked at um, the difference between knowing the demographics and not knowing the demographics. But if, if you compare country to country, you might know a lot about the demographics of one country versus another. So, to what extent might that help you if you know if you have the data about the country demographics? Uh. I mean, it's an interesting idea. I uh, I can imagine. I mean, even within India, there are massive demographic differences yeah, from course. state to state, and so perhaps even there, these kinds of ideas could be useful. But we haven't really we haven't really uh, explored this idea. All right. Well, one more question. <laughs> so. Uh, a number of years ago, we ran a uh, U.S.-China Computer Science Leadership Summit. We actually had three summit meetings, two in China and one in the U.S. And there was a lot of discussion about AI and health at these meetings. 
Among them were discussions about developing apps that would reward good health behavior. The question is whether apps, you know, given the ubiquitousness of, of smartphones, whether apps might actually have a wider potential for influence than actually phone calls. So, great question. So the population we are serving here, um, this is all sort of these uh, very low income populations that have, don't have access to smartphones. So these are all simple features of feature phones. And so apps are difficult, literacy is very low, and so text messages are also not a good choice. And so voice-based calling becomes the idea of choice. Now they're saying, okay, we can try WhatsApp, but even with that, they estimate maybe 10% of the population, 20% may be reached by WhatsApp. But the rest, given this kind of population, you are required to go with uh, voice or assumption, assumption that they are going to be these feature phones and watch phones. In general with apps, but if you think about something like say diabetes and for say the population here in the United States, that indeed is uh, you know something that people are trying, uh, for example, you know, Verily as an app that's one or so forth. So that's something definitely uh, of great interest, but I suppose it would depend on the kind of population, the you know, access to cell phone, access to smartphones and all those kinds of things. Literacy with the actual uh, being able to interact with WhatsApp and, and you know just being digitally literate, uh, in addition to just being able to be literate enough to read what's in a text message, all these things are going to influence what strategy. Is. Well, great. So now everyone hopefully is, could see why we invited Malin. <laughs> and Malin, thank, thank you so much. This was a great talk. Thank you so much. So our, our next speaker is one of our babies. He was our a postdoc here. And Jude, welcome home. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have a tradition at Dimax that we tell people once they were here, they never escaped.